back, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Potterless, the tale of a 24-year-old man reading a series of children's novels. Uh, I am joined by the lovely Charlotte Dow. You may know her as Charlotte Eight Pie from the internet. Charlotte, how are you? I am very well, thank you. Thank you for having me on this magical podcast. I mean, literally magical. It is magical. It really is. Uh, <laughs> it's magical because I somehow lasted many years without reading Harry Potter. I seriously don't know how magic. you got through life without this. Like, especially running in our nerdy circle of friends. Yeah. And that's the fun thing is that our whole little YouTube crew is obsessed with Harry Potter. Uh, and I think that a lot of them will be featured on the podcast. I think that's the plan. But I wanted to have you as an early guest because A, you love Harry Potter a lot. B, I love you a lot. And C, you've got oh. podcasting experience. So it's a, it's a whole big three whirlwind of fun. This is true. These are all true things. Yeah, so you know how the format of this is going to go. The listeners know how the whole format's going to go, so let's get right into it. Holla. Chapter 8 was the last thing we discussed, which was called The Potions Master. Now we've gone into Chapter 9, The Midnight Duel. Um, Spooky. So basically, I know, <laughs> and uh, I've been told before reading this, I was told that this was not included in the movie, uh, and I just realized that I don't remember the second half of the movie very well. <laughs> It has also been like a really long time since I've read it. I mean, I reread a lot of it to prepare for this podcast. Uh, Good. I'm very glad. Because I don't think, I think I read it or like read it. I was reading it like alongside my dad, which mean, meant he was sure. reading most of it to me uh, okay, okay. when I was like eight. So mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> it's been, it's been a, it's been a time. <laughs> It's been quite yeah. a time. And yeah, I think I saw the movie whenever it like first came to DVD. Uh, and I don't know if the movie was bad or if I just don't remember it well, but I feel like a lot of things happened in the end of the book that I was like, wait, that didn't happen. Right. But I've been confirmed from friends that have read the book that uh, A, the move, the first movie is actually pretty yeah, it's bad. Not good. And B, it was directed by a guy named Christopher Columbus, which just <laughs> makes it great that anyone with that name is just a horrible human. He was like the only... <laughs> He's like okay as a I'm I'm sure he's okay as a person but like he <laughs> ruined that and he ruined Rent like he directed the Rent movie Oh he did that too I've heard that It makes about absolutely the Rent movie. no sense because his main like directing credits are for like family films it makes absolutely no sense and I think he was like the only American to direct it as well, which you need to have like a bit of a British sensibility. Just proves that British are better at us at everything. Yeah. Okay, let's let's get right into it. So let's this chapter it. starts off with Harry Potter basically describing how much he hates Malfoy, uh, really dislikes him, and it was just like an opening paragraph about how he's like, this guy's the worst. <laughs> they go outside and they're having flying lessons, which Harry Potter is super hyped for, but they find out that they're like paired with Slytherin, which makes him really nervous because he doesn't want to fly in front of Malfoy and be bad and get picked on further. I don't understand how anybody was getting behind Malfoy other than the fact that he was like rich and his parents are powerful yeah. because he's just he's just a jerk. Like even by Slytherin standards, he's the worst. No, he it's not like he has anything cool going for him. Yeah. All he does is like make fun of people in the meanest ways. Like he's not like, "Oh, Harry, you're, you know, like your hair is silly or Ron, you know, you're a ginger." He's like, "Ron, your family's poor, Harry, you don't have parents." <laughs> it's like, "What kind of awful bully are you?" Like, how are he has those two friends. How are his two friends like, "Yo, man, like Calm it down. Jeez. Like, like. <laughs> well, they're pretty awful as well. I think they, I don't think any of them like have an emotion, like an EQ. Like they just do not have emotions. <laughs> yeah, they haven't really, I don't know that those two characters have said any words aside from the narrator just describing them as being behind Malfoy and laughing when he laughs. It's like Crab and Goyle were there. They were like both very large. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he doesn't want to make a fool of himself in front of Malfoy, uh, especially since Malfoy talks about flying in Quidditch and being good at them all the time. Harry hasn't been getting any mail, and Malfoy takes notice to this. So Malfoy, of course, has to go and be a dick about it and, you know, brag to Harry that A, Malfoy gets a lot of mail because he's spoiled rotten, <laughs> and B, Harry doesn't get any mail because he doesn't really have, you know, a family. <laughs> so they don't send him things. Uh, Malfoy is sure to remind everyone about this fact. Professor Hooch, which, by the way, amazing name. Amazing really name. And, like, in the books and the movies, she's, like, the perfect 
British, like, lesbian gym teacher stock character. <laughs> okay, great. Because I was very sad that Professor Hooch's only role in this in this book was a very brief stint of teaching flying. So Seriously. you saying that she is great. I'm glad she's coming back. Because I was like, yo, I need more I mean, more she's hooch. really not around that much. She's, it's like, this is kind of her main thing. But I kind okay. of wish that she and, like, the herbology teacher whose name I can't remember. Sprout. Yeah, Professor Sprout. Like, I wish they Which is they the funniest thing. Out. It's like, what should we name the plant teacher? How about a plant? Brilliant, J.K. Rowling. Brilliant. In my mind, they're, like, secretly married and, like, Ooh. live in a small hut in Hogsmeade and, like, have a lot of dogs. <laughs> oh, okay, I'm excited. I'm excited of that thought. And also, I know Hogsmeade exists, but I have no idea what it is. Right. This that doesn't is, really come into play until, like, trend. the third book. Okay, so. <laughs> this will be a common trend as I go out, is there will be a lot of things that I know exist but don't know when they come into play. Right. Like, I don't know when Butterbeer comes into play either, but I've had it also before. Also third book. A Harry Potter world. Okay. It's delicious. The third book seems awesome. <laughs> it is really good. I really enjoyed it. It was like butterscotchy and amazing uh, and no beer in it. Nope. So. Although I think anyway. they, they have started uh, like actually selling beer there. Anyway, oh, side note. Good. Can as you continue? <laughs> oh, no, I shall. Let's see. So uh, Professor Hooch is teaching them flying. Neville begins to fly, uh, and he can't control himself, so he flies super high and falls off and breaks his wrist. Classic Neville. Yeah, <laughs> classic Neville. I'm really excited to see how he turns into super attractive Neville Longbottom by the end of the book, <laughs> or by the end of the series. <laughs> Malfoy steals his Remember All, which is like this little white spherical thing that he got uh, in the mail from his parents. It's supposed to remind you when you've forgotten to do something, but it doesn't tell you what it is. So I don't see the right. purpose of this thing at all. Yeah, like, Joe, <laughs> you really didn't think of the logic behind this thing. Like, it just doesn't I make any say, sense. I want to give J.K. Rowling the benefit of the doubt that this was written in as a joke. Right. And even if it was accidental, it's pretty funny to be like, oh, what's this magical thing you have, Neville? It's, oh, it tells me when I forgot something. It's like, great. That would be like, it's, it's the worst feeling is when you're like, ah, what was that thing I forgot to do? And now you have a physical object that right. tells you that. I guess it could work as, I'm, I'm trying to think of it as in like a real world application. Whenever, it's like when you set whenever, an alarm whenever, on your I'm, iPhone and you, you give it a very vague name and you're like, oh, I'll remember what Dorito means. <laughs> and then you don't remember it. <laughs> I think whenever I like realize I've forgotten something, it, it causes me to go back and be like, what was it? What, like, I have to process it more. And I'm like, this actually would, might be helpful to me just to like help me problem solve on my own. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, Malfoy steals that. Harry Potter yells at Malfoy to give it back. Uh, and then they get into this flying battle. So they both fly up 50 feet in the air. At this point, Harry realizes, A, I'm naturally really good at <laughs> flying. And B, I'm much better than Malfoy because he starts to like get nervous yep. and broom shake and everything. Never so been on a broom the, before. Never also. Been. He's just a natural. Come on. So uh, like the coward that he is, Malfoy throws the thing into the air and then flies down to safety. Harry does like this intense dive bomb to catch it, and he does. And I was like, oh, cool. This is the foreshadowing of him getting recruited to be the snitch catcher, the seeker <laughs> on the Quidditch team. I like and the then... snitch catcher better. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So then I thought he was going to like audition or try out for the Quidditch team. But no, McGonagall just sees him doing this and then acts like she's getting Harry Potter in trouble. And then the whole time I'm like, she's not going to actually get him in trouble. She's going to secretly recruit him for the team. And that's exactly what happens. Yeah. So she, she just has like resting into, disappointed face. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not mad. I'm just disappointed. <laughs> so and she, then everyone just bursts into sobs. <laughs> So she, like, takes him into a secret room and is basically snags uh, Wood, the captain of the Quidditch team, out of class. And then... Can I borrow Wood? <laughs> oh, I didn't realize how amazing that sentence was. Truly. Oh, man. Also, like, so, he was my ultimate, like, 10-year-old crush. Oh, the how could you not? He's him. captain he, of the Quidditch was, team. He was adorable. Yeah, I mean, come on. Captain of the Kurdish team. Clearly. What's not to love? So brings the two of them into the room and then basically tells Wood, like, hey, Gryffindor needed a seeker. This dude's amazing. He's going to be the exception to the first year's can't play rule, which is a very silly rule. I don't understand the concept of that Harry at all. Harry Potter, you will find out, is the exception to literally every rule at Hogwarts. <laughs> He's also the exception to the rule of, of Voldemort kills everyone. <laughs> also that. <laughs> <laughs> so Malfoy challenges him to a midnight wizard's duel, which sounds incredible, and then I'm supremely let down by what happens. 
<laughs> so I read the whole uh, chapter and I'm like, no wonder this got cut from the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At first, when my friend told me that the the midnight duel got cut, I was like, oh man, like this is so intense. How could it not be in the movie? And then it happens, and I'm like, oh, this is happening. <laughs> so basically, uh, Harry has no idea what it means, and Ron steps up and it was like, yeah, he does. I'm his number two. And then they leave, and Harry's like, what does number two mean? And Ron's like, oh, that means I take your place if you die. And I was like, I'm even more excited for this. <laughs> so the plan is to duel in the trophy room. Hermione is telling them, like, no, don't do it. You'll get in trouble, like the wuss that she is. Uh, but Harry and Ron sneak out anyway through the painting. And then Hermione gets locked out of the painting. I'm also confused of how walking through the painting is a door. I feel like I, I need a visual like representation. a hole in the wall behind the portrait and the portrait like swings open like a door and then you have okay. to go through the hole i don't know it, do, it, it doesn't you don't like blue skidoo from blue's clues through the painting no i <laughs> wish that was it that would be so much better <laughs> and more magical truly so they're going to the trophy room hermione's locked out and the person that opens the painting is gone so she can't get back in the same thing also happens to neville so basically the four of them are doing this uh and hermione and neville don't want to be there at all they get to the trophy room malfoy isn't there and mrs norris and filch show up so at this point, they realize that the whole thing was just a trap, and Malfoy had tipped off Filch and Mrs. Norris. Didn't actually want to fight, just wanted to get Harry in trouble and ideally expelled, because Malfoy's the biggest coward ever. The biggest coward, but, like, that is a true Slytherin move. <laughs> like, Oh, yeah, so super much, cunning, super So much genius. cunning, so much ambition. <laughs> Yeah, it's brilliant. So they're, like, trying to sneak away quietly, but then they accidentally bump into a set of knight's armor, which makes a ton of noise, <laughs> so then they have to run a lot. They're, they're running a bunch, and then they get to a door, and they bump into Peeves, the cool hall monitor, as opposed to these other two. <laughs> um, and he basically is, like, kind of messing with them, like, ooh, I should tell, I should tell Filch and Mrs. Norris that you guys are here. And they're like, please don't, please don't, please don't. So then he just screams out loud, like, students in the hall, super loudly. Uh, and then they're like, ah, shit. So Hermione does a spell to open the door. They get behind the door. And then Peeves actually turns out to be a huge bro uh, and just doesn't actually tell Filch and Mrs. Norris where the kids are. He Good guy, you know, just kind of messes with the kids and then doesn't. Yeah, and he also wasn't in the movie, right? No, he's not, like... He's one of, I think he's one of, like, the characters that all the fans were, like, this was the most glaring omission, was, yeah. like, no peeves. I mean, he doesn't serve, like, a huge plot purpose, but, like, he's fun, you know? Yeah, and he's, he's kind of, he, like, he's kind have. of a dick, but he's fun. But, yeah, in the <laughs> best way. Like, he messes with both people in this situation, which is great, and, you know. All, all is well. Right. So they're on the other side of the door, uh, and then they realize that the door that they've gone is the one that's locking off the forbidden corridor of the Gryffindor dorm. Oh, or no. The Hogwarts or whatever. So they're, they're in the forbidden thing. Uh, so they see that it, a three-headed dog is in there, standing over a trap door, uh, and Harry wonders what he is guarding. Uh, and he also believes that it, it is guarding the grubby package, which I have found out on my own that this is definitely the Sorcerer's Stone. Oh, yeah. uh, I realized this while I was describing chapter eight to my friend Alex on the last episode. Uh, <laughs> I'm really excited that I discovered the plot of a book designed for third graders. So super it, good times. Like, it's very apparent. Yeah, no. I, at first I was like, I wonder what this package is. And then I was like, wait, I bet I know what this package is. <laughs> I recorded like an intro episode before I read any of the books thinking, listing what I thought happened and everything from what I remember. Cause I've read the first or I've read zero books and watched the first four and a half movies. Got it. Uh, and I thought that the three headed dog was in the second book right. and the giant snake was in the first book. <laughs> so at this point when I got the book, I was like, Oh, I bet the giant snake is in the next one. There's a lot and of then, like large beasts in the first yeah, three films. Large beasts in the dungeon books areas. Whatever. Yeah. Because I assume the Chamber of Secrets is similar to this secret passageway thing. This is why I think I just like intertwined the first two books a whole ton. Pretty much. <laughs> and then it just gets like dark and a lot of people die. And it, yes. yeah, it gets very adult very fast. <laughs> yeah. And that's and that's one thing I'm excited that I haven't uh, seen those movies because like the big what I don't know is like the big important things. So that's more fun. Right. Okay, I'm so excited so chapter for you. 10. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best part of it is everyone's like, oh my gosh, I wish I've never read them. Okay, so chapter 10, Halloween. Uh, so Hermione is super upset at, about the whole wizard duel thing and isn't talking to Harry and Ron. Uh, Harry gets a present that's flown in by a bunch of owls, uh, which turns out to be the Nimbus 2000 from Professor McGonagall. 
which pretty sweet because nice. Nimbus 2000, from what I remember in the movies, is gorgeous and beautiful. It's like the Maserati of the Maybach of brooms. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So he gets that. Malfoy, Malfoy, eh, Malfoy gets super jealous. Uh, and one question that I had is, how did Ron and Harry not just make fun of Malfoy for the rest of the series and the fact that he was too scared to show up to the duel? Like, right, I feel like exactly. that should have been a major... A major thing to be like, hey, you're a giant baby and you're the worst. And that just like never comes up. You're a giant weenie who's just like hiding behind your money and influence. Yeah, it's so absurd. I really don't get it at all. Malfoy gets jealous that Harry gets a broom. And not only is it like a broom and isn't it first years aren't supposed to have brooms at all. Right. But the Nimbus 2000 is like the best broom. Right. And I, and Ron at some point is like, Oh, what do you have Malfoy and lists some other model? Uh, and I know nothing. But once he said, I was like, Ooh, that model must suck. <laughs> like that's gotta be like the Honda civic of brooms to use your analysis. Basically, It's a Jetta. <laughs> yeah. So then we have an amazing scene where wood teaches Harry the rules of Quidditch. And this is the part that I was most excited for because Quidditch to me, when I wasn't reading the books, that was the one thing where I was like, man, Quidditch is the one thing that I could really get behind. Yep. And then when I was in college, Quidditch is like a big like intramural sport and my school took it super seriously. Oh, yeah. So even then I was like, this seems really cool. So the basic rules of Quidditch are there's seven players. There are three ch chasers who throw a ball call called the quaffle through the big three rings for points. The saddest part of the book happens when Harry goes, oh, so it's like basketball, but with rings up in the air. And then Wood replies, what's basketball? I cried for 30 minutes. <laughs> Ball is clearly not life. Not life in Hogwarts. Oh, I was so sad. So there's one keeper who uh, basically tries to block the balls from the quaffle from going into each of these three rings. And then there's two bludgers who tried to knock the bludgers are balls that tried to knock people off their brooms. And then the position players are called beaters and they try to hit the bludgers away from their teammates and towards the other teammates. They beat the balls. And they beat the balls. And the best thing is that the Weasley twins are the beaters. <laughs> and from the little knowledge I know of the Weasley twins, I was like, yes, yeah, like, they would be the people accurate. that just try to hit people off of their brooms indirectly. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then the final ball is the snitch, the golden snitch, which is a, like a little tiny golf ball with wings that flies around at a million miles an hour. And the seeker chases after it. And if the seeker catches it, it's worth 150 points and ends the game, which I think is a bit excessive. <laughs> Because I don't know that they say how many points you get for a throw through the ring with the quaffle. I, I want to say it's like 10 points. Yeah, something like that. Five it's or like 10. either 10 or 20. Yeah. Yeah, it's something, it's not a lot where like basically your team can be garbage. Right. It really just comes down to having a good seeker, which is like not good for a team sport when only one person really matters. Right. But there have been <laughs> cases of like one team wins but the other one catches a snitch, but it doesn't matter because like the other team won. You're down, you're down 160 and you're just the worst at Quidditch ever. Exactly. Uh, so would Ireland uh, will win, but Crumb will catch the snitch. That will make sense to you later. <laughs> no, Crumb is the super buff dude from the fourth book. I remember him from the movies. Yeah, buddy. <laughs> Oh, man. So Wood hits a bunch of golf balls to Harry to practice catching the snitch. Uh, I like that the Wizards have golf, but not basketball. Come I know. On, like, get your get your priorities yeah, like, straight. How Wizarding did you get world. these golf balls, but you don't know what basketball is? Like, yeah, like what sports should we do? Oh, let's do the lame one. Maybe it's because like Hogwarts is in Scotland, and like golf is big in Scotland. They probably just yeah, like pick them up. Basketball is definitely not big in Scotland. <laughs> it, is, it totally is. Basketball in no, Scotland? No, no, sorry. Um, golf, sorry. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> I was like, basketball, I haven't heard of any great Scottish basketball I don't players. even know, like, do people play basketball in England? I, I don't even know. <laughs> they probably, they're never very good, so. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so sorry to the, all balls. the, like, British basketball players out there. No, no, you know, all right, I'm trying to, I, Nicholas Batum's the only one I can think of. <laughs> so anyway, uh, so, oh no, wait, Nicholas Batum is French, what am I talking about? I don't know. <laughs> So uh, Harry catches them all and Wood's like, yes, we're going to be awesome. So it then turns out to be Halloween and all the designs are up, which seems awesome. Halloween seems like the coolest time to be at a wizard. Truly. School. So then you get the classic Wingardium Liviosa scene from the movies, which I remember really well. Ron pronounces it slightly wrong and nothing <laughs> happens. And then Hermione's like, it's not Liviosa, it's Liviosa. And then can make a feather <laughs> lift up in the air. Not like, Liviosa. Uh, uh, like whippy frickin' do Hermione. She's still the worst. I'm glad that by the end of the book, she becomes 
becomes not the worst. But at this point when I was reading this, I was like, I hate her with every fiber of my being. Yeah, I think she's just like, she hasn't really figured out what her place is in the school yet. So she's like compensating by just being a know-it-all. Yep. And I'm like, that's yep. not and how no you friends make friends, girl. <laughs> like, yeah, speaking of her not making friends, uh, Ron makes Hermione cry when he says too loudly that he doesn't think Hermione has any friends, <laughs> uh, which is so mean. <laughs> 11-year-olds are the worst. <laughs> oh, yeah, no. Like, 6th, 7th grade, easily the worst time of my life oh, ever. Terrible. So... The next day, there's a troll in the dungeons, which is a big deal. All the prefects are leading the houses back to their dorms, so getting all the kids to safety. But Harry and Ron remember someone told them earlier during the day that Hermione hasn't been in class. She's just, like, crying in the girls' bathroom all day. So when they're on their way back, they're like, oh, no, we got to get Hermione. So they sneak around and then see the troll. They also see Snape running up to the third floor, and they're like, huh, I wonder why he's on the third floor. Uh, and that's where the forbidden corridor is, so it's super suspect. Oh, no. Uh, so they see the troll, they lock it in a room, but then they realize the room that they've locked it in is the girls' bathroom, which is literally the only room that they couldn't lock it in. <laughs> <laughs> they could have picked any room, and they picked the only one that doesn't work. Ding dongs. So they're like, oh, no, crap. So they go in, and then they're like, we're going to have to fight this troll. So Ron throws a pipe at it to distract it. <laughs> Harry runs around and grabs Hermione. <laughs> Uh, the troll then has Ron pinned, so Harry jumps on its back, sticks its wand in its nose, uh, and then Ron does Wingardium Liviosa, but he knows how to say it right, thank you, smart mouth, uh, know-it-all Hermione. And then he, like, picks the troll's club up, and it knocks him on the head, knocking him out. Crush it, Ron. Killing it. Just saving the day. Yep. So, McGonagall, Snape, and Quirrell bust in, and Hermione covers by lying and saying that uh, Harry and Ron were only there to save her because she was going to try to stop the troll on her own. Now, I don't understand why she lied w this specific way of saying that she was going to stop the troll on her own. Why didn't she just say, like, I was in the bathroom and I didn't hear people leaving? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I've, like, been crying in the bathroom all day. I didn't yeah. know. Like, I don't, I don't understand I why. She, like. Yeah, I don't understand why she just like make this lie that then loses them some house cut points. I know. So super lame. Because of the efforts, Hermione loses five points from Gryffindor, but Harry and Ron each get plus five for beating a giant troll. I feel like they should get more than plus five. Oh, definitely. For... They literally <laughs> saved someone's life. Yeah, I feel like that's a pretty big deal. And like uh, reduce so. the risk for the entire school. Yeah, totally. Uh, the three get back. They all kind of say thanks to each other and eat dinner. And then from then on, they're all homies. Right. It's like said, like, from this point on, they're all great. That's a really weird progression to go through. Like, it, it just seemed very fast to me. And maybe it's just because I was reading it from, like, halfway through this time. Uh -huh. But it's just like... I guess maybe being like war bros or so. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it does happen super quick. It's literally like two lines, but I think it's kind of one of those, like you go through hell with people and you come out on the other end, like best friends exactly. kind of thing. Yeah. So chapter 11, Quidditch. Hermione has now become more chill. She helps them out with homework, does spells when they're not supposed to, teaches Harry about Quidditch and rules and all these other things. So now she's becoming a homie. Harry was reading a book about Quidditch outside with the squad. And then Snape, who loves to just pick on Harry, takes it away and deducts house cut points from Gryffindor. So Natch. Harry wants the book back because he's like, I need to read up before the first game of the season. You know, I'm pretty nervous about this. So he goes to the teacher's staff room to ask for it back. And when he opens the door, he sees Filch tending to a large gash on Snape's leg while uh, he's complaining about the three heads. So this seems super suspect that Snape was in the room he's not supposed to be in. Oh, no. So... Snape sees Harry peeking in and yells at him to get out. He thinks that Snape let in the troll, and then he would go into the forbidden room while everyone was distracted. So, you know, they, this is continuing to paint the picture that Snape is the bad guy. Yep. Uh, very heavy-handedly. <laughs> uh, They're really just know, laying it on. Yeah, even, though, even though I know he wasn't the bad guy, like, reading this, I was like, okay, if you're gonna, like do all these like super suspect things it's the classic scooby-doo thing right. where the sketchiest person is never it and it's always the first person you meet it's a classic red herring and it actually tends to be to hold true in this book because quirrell turban guy who has voldemort living in his head is the first professor that you meet right it's like classic scooby-doo <laughs> but like um, he's still 
pretty sketchy throughout. Like, or maybe it's yeah, just... Yeah, he's sketchy, but you think he's weird. I think if I didn't know, I would have been more surprised. Right. Yeah, the first time I read it, I definitely, like, didn't suspect him. Also, I was eight, but, like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm 24. Like, I think I can put two things together. But I was like, oh, my God, it was him and not Snape. Oh. <laughs> then it's the first game of the Quidditch. The first game of the Quidditch season. So Harry's super nervous. The game starts, uh, and the announcer is funny. He, like, starts talking about the girl on the Quidditch team right. and, like, keeps hut subtly hinting that she's hot and, like, he wants to ask her out and all this <laughs> stuff, and he keeps getting yelled at by McGonagall. It's fantastic. I think they really casted think they should him, like, a little better. bit younger in yeah. the... They did. It was, like, the only black person in the movie. Yeah, was he was, like, going to be, like, a, he's, like, a first or second year, and I think they were probably, like, it's probably creepy if he, like is asking this girl mm. out like while she's playing Quidditch yeah. and probably they just didn't have time for it. So definitely a miscast. Yeah. But that's like, <laughs> I, I love Lee Jordan. I wish there was more Lee Jordan. <laughs> Needs to be more Lee Jordan. Yeah. Lee, Lee Jordan spinoff book. Let's get Lee that. Jordan spinoff book. The kids believe that Snape is messing with Harry Potter's broom because Hermione sees him like whispering when Harry's broom starts like freaking out and he can't control it. So Hermione sneaks around and does a tiny little spell to light Snape's, Snape's cloak on fire. Uh, so then he stops mumbling. Harry gets control of his broom, sees the snitch, and immediately does like a dive bomb for it. And like catches it with his mouth by accident, but catches it. <laughs> so Gryffindor wins, which is great. You catch it so, in your mouth. Then the kids go to Hagrid to, to say like, look, we saw Snape. You know, we think Snape was in the room with the dog, and we think he was messing with Harry's broom. Uh, and Hagrid reveals that the dog is named Fluffy and is his Ooh. by accident. Uh, and he also slips out that he let Dumbledore use the, the dog to guard the room. So now the kids know that something's up. When they bring up Snape messing with Harry Potter's broom, Hagrid is like kind of weird and awkward and hush-hush about it. And he is also weird and awkward and hush-hush, but accidentally slips out uh, that the only reason the dog is guarding something is because it's the, the business of Dumbledore and Nicholas Flamel. And they're like, who's Nicholas Flamel? And Hagrid's like, ah, crap, I wasn't supposed to say that. <laughs> Why do they, like, trust Hagrid with any secrets at this school. Like, Cause just, he's not really a teacher. He's not really a teacher. <laughs> and he's like, he will give up information so easily. Like, I yes, don't as understand. As later. we will find out later. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then we get into chapter 12, the mirror of the arised. So it's Christmas. It's Arisen. Uh, and Harry's super excited. Be oh, Arisen. Okay, good. I was like, <laughs> I don't know how to say this. Uh, it's desire so. spelled backwards because. Whoa. Whoa. Like, good J.K. job, J.K. Rowling proving again and again that she can't name things well. <laughs> In this, so I was saying um, before we started the podcast, we have, or she has this movie coming out that's um, based on Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, which is like a Hogwarts mm -hmm. Uh, a textbook, textbook that they brought in the first book, and I'm really glad she's just copping out and making all the textbooks into <laughs> movies now. <laughs> there, I actually like had the book version of that, and it was wonderful. Um, I've heard good things because it has like all these like notes in the margins from like Ron and oh. Harry. Oh, that's super yeah, cool. it's really cute. And uh, but anyway, she put all these like stories out on Pottermore as a mm -hmm. lead up to it to kind of give us a background of information on the the history of magic in North America. Uh, because yes. this one's set in New York. and Oh, I'm way hyped. Yeah, it's like some of the stories are a little problematic. Um, yes. <laughs> naturally. But there's one bit about prohibition and how like Whoa. the magical community just did not go along with that. And they were like, the giggle water is non-negotiable. <laughs> Oh my goodness! And I'm they like, you can't, alcohol you can't water. call this giggle water. <laughs> oh, I know what I'm calling alcohol now, though. <laughs> I'm for sure calling it giggle water. Get oh, some, man. get some giggle water. Get my drink you on. Mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned Pottermore, and I remember Pottermore came out like at the height of our like YouTube friendship. Oh my god! Uh, and I did it because everyone else was doing it, and I did it up to the point where it gets sorted, and I got Gryffindor. Just for reference, uh, what what house did you get? I am a Hufflepuff, and I am like okay. a very proud Hufflepuff now. Okay. Before. That then I was like, but I want to be a Ravenclaw because I want to be like smart and stuff. But like, I could, I was gonna either guess Ravenclaw or Hufflepuff. Yeah, I'm definitely one of the like in between e houses. Um, sure. I, I'm, I totally see you as a Gryffindor, by the way. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> although, my because I love myself. <laughs> my, my like ex boss, who's like really into Harry Potter, was like, Charlotte's definitely a Slytherin. I'm like, 
I'm no offended. Way. Yeah, I would have been offended too. I could see myself being a Slytherin like there's, a little bit. There's good parts of Slytherin. Like you can yeah. be ambitious and like not and a dick. But yeah, just most people are dicks. Yeah, most of them are dicks. <laughs> so you are the second Hufflepuff uh, to I've had on the podcast. Alex from the previous episode was also a Hufflepuff. Yeah, I really hope I get a Slytherin at one point. I hope maybe Tim will be a Slytherin. Who knows? Maybe. <laughs> but Hufflepuff <laughs> is definitely like the party house. Because we were by oh, yeah. our, like... You're super loyal, so you're always hanging with the squad. Yeah, they're, and their um, they're common room is, like, down by the kitchen. Oh, so they're, like, hanging up. with the house Late elves and, like, eating stuff. And they're just, like, super loyal and bro It's basically a frat, so... Nah, that's what's <laughs> up. No, Hufflepuff seems super chill. Definitely. Okay, so, uh, mirror of the desire backwards. <laughs> so it's Christmas. Harry's really excited that it's Christmas because he gets to stay at Hogwarts <laughs> and doesn't have to go home to his awful family. I would much uh, rather stay at Hogwarts for Christmas than like yo, deal real talk. With my after, after the way they described it, I would have been like, guys, I'm not coming home. <laughs> <laughs> because here's what goes down. So the Weasleys are also staying, and uh, Harry gets some presents from Ron and Hermione and from the Weasley family as well. He gets like a classic Weasley sweater, mm-hmm. which Harry loves and the rest of the family also loves, but. Uh, or not, I should say, oh, the twins love it as a joke, <laughs> and the rest of the Weasleys They love it, it ro- which, ironically, and yeah. Ron just hates the color maroon. Which is funny, because he's in Gryffindor, which is like scarlet, which is basically the right, same exactly. color. He's like, oh, I hate maroon, but I'm totally fine with dark red. <laughs> <laughs> Harry also gets the invisibility cloak from a stranger, who says, like, your dad left me with this. Uh, and you should put it to good use. My initial guess was that Snape gave it to him, uh, but turns out it ends up being Dumbledore, yep. uh, it's which also Dumbledore. makes sense. I thought I was being like super gung ho because I know Snape in the end turns out to be like super cool. Yeah, but I don't this think was not Snape. I don't think they would have entrusted Snape with like any of James Potter's possessions. Yeah, because you learn later other. in the book that he hated him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when he got the invisibility cloak, it was said that it's his dad's, right. and that yeah. So that makes it even more special. So Harry uses it to sneak through the Forbidden Library because they've been trying to read up about Nicholas Flamel, but they've been unsuccessful because they need to go to the restricted section of the library. Harry first sneaks off by himself to do it, and he tries to open a book, but it it screams really loudly, so he runs inside, and when he runs away, he finds this room that has a mirror in it. And this mirror is the mirror of the Erised, and it's got that, like, inscribed on... On the classroom. I think it's on the door. Yeah. I think it's supposed to be in, like... Well, it's not in runes, because runes is, like, its own character system. But anyway, it's, like, some language. But it's not Latin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so they get there, and he sees the old mirror. And when Harry looks at this mirror, he sees a bunch of people standing behind him. But when he turns around, they're not there. So he can only see through the mirror. Uh, and at first, he's confused of who he's seeing. But then he realizes that it's looks like him close enough where he's like oh this is my mom and dad and he tries he tries to speak to them but they can't say anything they can only wave to him so he kind of like chills and looks around at them and feels like all you know nostalgic and he starts to remember the the death scene again like anytime he learns something about something that was present during the part where his parents got killed right he like remembers it more so that happens. which is like kind of weird because he was li- he was literally a baby i'm like how are you making yeah. memories at this point but like that's pretty <laughs> hey like watching your parents magic. you know get murdered in front of you i think that kind of sticks usually <laughs> probably a little bit he ends up going back to his room uh and then the next night harry brings ron along with him with the invisibility cloak and they're not even they're not even going to the library due to the female thing. They just go straight to the mirror room. When when Ron looks in the mirror, he doesn't see Harry's parents, but instead he sees him holding a Quidditch cup um, for being captain of the Quidditch team. They kind of realize it's like, oh, you know, this mirror, like we see different things. But then Mrs. Norris, the cat, notices them. Uh, so they have to like sneak away, run back to the room. Thankfully, they're invisible. <laughs> so, so that works out pretty well. And also she's a um, cat. Yeah. <laughs> But they were like, I wonder if the cat can see through it. I was like, this, would have, this would be super intense. Ron's afraid of getting caught. So Harry wants to go back a third night in a row. And Ron's like, no, I'm not going. So Harry goes alone. And when, once he gets into the room, Dumbledore's waiting there for him. Or he, he like makes himself appear because um, he can just make himself invisible. Dumbledore explains to Harry that the mirror shows the deepest desire of whoever looks into it. Harry's like, oh, this makes sense of why I would show my parents. Uh, and then Dumbledore's like not mad at all. You know, right. because... 
Harry could super get in trouble for roaming the halls. But Dumbledore's like, nah, man, it's all good. And then, like, use your, you know, he, he mentions that the cloak is, like, I, th- he, I forget the adjective, but he says, like, that, that majestic cloak or something. <laughs> like, put it to good use. Uh, so I should have picked up right there that Dumbledore's the one gave, that gave it to right. him. But I was like, no, it's got to be Snape. But it wasn't. <laughs> also, like, Dumbledore was very clearly, like, the executor of their, of, like, his parents' will because, you know, he brought him to the Dursleys and, like, yeah, you know, he did, everything. did all those arrangements and shit. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, chapter 13, Nicholas is called Nicholas Flamel. And I was like, ah, I bet he finds out who Nicholas Flamel is. Uh, also, the whole time, I remembered that Nicholas Flamel was a name that was mentioned on the back of the f- Chocolate Frog Dumbledore, like, trading card. Mm-hmm. And the whole time, Harry's like, I've read this name before somewhere. <laughs> and it's just like, I'm like, you idiot! Like, he's on the card! <laughs> I just remember it stood out to me because it calls Flamel Dumbledore's partner. And since, uh, since J.K. Rowling has now revealed that Dumbledore is gay, I want to know if they're a thing. But then they later reveal that Flamel had as a wife, so it's all sorts of confusing. It's a, it's a secret... Yeah, or maybe they're like Polly. I don't know. <laughs> big old, big old love triangle going on. So Harry takes Dumbledore's advice and stops going to the mirror. Uh, so Christmas ends, and then Harry, Ron, and Hermione uh, continue to try to figure out who Flamelli is by reading books in the library. Um, but Harry gets like busier and busier with Quidditch practice because Gryffindor's finally raising up in the cup ranks because they're winning a bunch of games. So. Harry has, like, a ton of Quidditch practice, which makes him super busy. And he's at practice, and he learns that Snape is going to be refereeing the next game, which has him super worried, because A, Snape already picks on him a ton in class, uh, and B, they thought that Snape was messing with Harry's broom. So he's like, what, you know, what kind of damage could he do if he was the referee? I also, like, (laughs) feel like he would be doing it super begrudgingly because just he does not seem like a quidditch fan no, he doesn't seem like he would want to f- he doesn't even seem like he'd want to fly right he like wouldn't want to fly and does not want to be around children for like more hours than he actually has to like. <laughs> <laughs> so they're they're hanging out with neville at one point uh after neville gets picked on by Malfo- malfoy and they're trying to uh, they're, they're trying to sound like, you got to stick up for yourself more, Neville. Uh, and he, he eats a chocolate frog and he has the gar- the, the trading card and he's like, oh, I already have Dumbledore. Like, do you want, do you want this Harry? Uh, and then they read the back and Harry's like, oh, Nicholas Flamel. So then they, <laughs> they's like, that's where I saw it. So, uh, Hermione's like, oh, and runs to her room to grab a book. And Hermione's like, oh, I don't know. I didn't think of this before. And they find out that Flamel is like this super old guy. He's like, a, you know, 600 something million. He's like 600 something years old, which is why they were looking in a book like recent. It was like recent stars in wizardry. And he wasn't <laughs> in there because he's a million years old. So they get a book and they find out that, uh, Flamel is once Dumbledore's partner and is the only wizard to make the sorcerer's stone. And they learn that this sorcerer's stone transforms any metal into gold and also produces an elixir of everlasting life. That's pretty, like, a, that's so, a good functioning Yeah, rock. super, <laughs> like, what two things do this, does this do? Uh, the two most important things. So <laughs> It uh, makes you so rich like, ah. and it makes you live forever, so. <laughs> yep. So then they're like, ah, I guess that's what the dog is guarding. And I was like, I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> <laughs> so the Quidditch game is happening. Harry's super nervous, but he is no longer nervous when he realizes that Dumbledore is going to be at the game because he's like, ah, oh, Snape wouldn't mess with me while Dumbledore's in the crowd. Basically, the game starts. Harry catches the golden snitch within the first five minutes. <laughs> and they're like, oh, we've won instantly. And that was Harry's plan all along. was like, I got to catch the snitch right away before Snape messes with me. Uh, but then Snape isn't even going to mess with him. Right. But he's like, I caught it super fast anyway. And it's like, I mean, it's good Harry. motivation to like live your best life. <laughs> yeah, live your best life so that this teacher doesn't mess with you. Right. Dumbledore then congratulates Harry for this astonishing feat. And then, as they're, as they're like, heading back, uh, Harry notices Snape going off into the Forbidden Forest, which is forbidden. It seems like a lot less forbidden than it actually, than they make it out to be, because everyone is hanging out there. <laughs> yeah, everyone goes there. Detention is there on purpose. Right. Hagrid's job is to, like, go hunting there. It doesn't seem super forbidden. It should just be called, like, the Scary yeah. Forest. So he, like, flies and, like, spies on him, and he hears him, like, talking, like, mean words to Quirrell. 
and mentions the Sorcerer's Stone, but then he flies away before they can notice him. So that's the end of chapter 13. We get into 14 now. Norbert, the Norwegian Ridgeback. So exams are coming up. You need to pass them in order to get to your second year, which is intense. <laughs> <laughs> that's I mean, ridiculous. It's the same it's thing like, as like school. You have to pass your, you know, all your classes to get to the next level. But I... it seemed it seems harsh <laughs> to go from like I'm a normal human to like look look I'm learning all about wizardry. You could like fail I'm... all your seventh grade classes and have to do seventh grade again. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. I stand corrected. The teachers give them a ton of homework over Easter break, which is two things I find interesting. A, that they got homework over Easter break, and B, that apparently Jesus exists <laughs> in Magic World. Uh, they haven't talked about that. Yeah, but... they have, like, all of the Christian holidays, even though, like, they're wizards. <laughs> and they must be very religious. I mean, you can have, so... you can have like, wizards for Jesus. <laughs> yeah, maybe Jesus is a wizard. Oh. No. Hagrid is in the library. And confirms that the dog is guarding the stone. Uh, and they find out he's reading a book about dragons. And they're like, I wonder why. Uh, and Harry mentions that Hagrid's always wanted to own one, but it's illegal to raise a dragon. There's a few dragons in Britain. The Ministry of Magic puts spells on muggles who have seen them so that they don't think dragons exist. <laughs> so the squad goes to Hagrid's house. And Hagrid reveals that Sprout, Flitwick, and McGonagall, and Snape all did enchantments on the trap door to protect it. And Hagrid was like, yeah, Snape is helping guard the stones. You freaking idiots. <laughs> <laughs> He's not being bad at all. Their reasoning is that Snape only helps so that he could know what the other enchantments are and that he doesn't know Quirrell's yet and he's trying to get that out of him so then he can go through the secret. So it's I very mean, like, elaborate. I mean, not, it's not a bad explanation. It's just incredibly stubborn. Yeah, very stubborn. They're like, no, no matter what anyone says about Snape, like, he's evil. <laughs> so they then notice that Hagrid has, Hagrid has a dragon egg in his fireplace. Uh, Hagrid says he won it in a game of cards, and it is that's the Norwegian Ridgeback. So the next day, Hagrid sends a note that it's hatching, so the squad goes over to see it. Uh, Malfoy has creeped and saw this, like that, that they got the note, and he has this evil grin all in his face all next week, so you know some crap's about to go down. Hagrid decides to name the, the, the dragon Norbert, and they realize that the best course of action is to send the dragon to Ron's older brother, Charlie, who lives in Romania and, like, studies dragons. So they write him a letter, and he replies that, Send it that, to Daenerys yes. Targaryen. She'll take care of him. <laughs> yeah, so basically they're like, they're like, yes, send it to me. Four of my friends will come and pick it up. You gotta go at night on the tallest tower and go. So they're like, okay. So they try to do that, but they're going up the tower, and, and Malfoy knows this is happening, so he's there, too, to try to, like, rat on McGonagall. But, or not rat on McGonagall, rat on them to McGonagall, but McGonagall ends up walking by and sees him in the tower, and, and Mal she's like, Malfoy, like, minus 20, you end detention, like, you can't be doing this. He's like, no, but Harry's coming with the dragon. And McGonagall's like, that's the most far-fetched thing I've ever heard, and then leaves. <laughs> so, Charlie's four friends come in, they, they set up Norbert in the harness, they fly away. His dragon bros. <laughs> yes, dragon homies. <laughs> so they go down the stairs, and then they get caught by Filch, because the idiots forgot to put the invisibility cloak back on. <laughs> They're just like, let's walk down. So stupid. <laughs> freaking rookie mistakes so mcgonagall sits him down in her office and is like yo what the hell so she thinks that they pulled a malfoy and tried to get him in trouble like in the same way that malfoy did with the whole trophy room thing so she gives them each detention and minus 50 points each which is like way intense That's a lot. but they each got 30 more than malfoy got for the same offense uh but you know Super intense. So minus 100 house points. Uh, Gryffindor is not winning the house cup anymore. Nope. That's for sure. So everyone now hates Harry Potter. Uh, even the Ravenclaws and Hufflepuffs are like, ah, <laughs> this guy's the worst. So the, the Quidditch team hates him because they're like, look at all the points that we won has gone to nothing. Uh, and Hermione and Neville get crap too. Because like Neville like tried to, tried to warn them and he ended up getting in trouble with McGonagall as well. So all three of them got minus 50. Right. So. That's 150 um, from Gryffindor. Rough. It's an intense, intense amount of points. The detention is that they have to go join Hagrid as he like is trying to put an injured, injured unicorn out of its pain in the Forbidden Forest. So they split up and follow the blood trail. Um, and they see something sketchy that isn't a werewolf. And it's Ronan the centaur, who's super weird. <laughs> I always, I like, when I first read this, I was like, what? Are, are you on crack? Like, <laughs> Yeah, they're so strange. So then... There is Bane, who is a bigger centaur, and he's even weirder. And they keep saying on over and over again 
that uh, that Mars is bright tonight, right. which is some sort of omen for something that they never explain. Also, like, centaur politics gets, like, very intense... I mean, like, it's kind of, it's, it's a slut, it's like very much a subplot, but like later on in the books, there's some like okay. serious centaur politics. Ooh, I'm excited. Yeah. They just seem like stoners at this point. <laughs> um, they, they progress on with Hagrid and Harry and Malfoy find the unicorn after the groups are switched due to Malfoy messing with Neville. So they find the unicorn and then there is a cloaked figure that comes out and starts drinking the unicorn's blood. Uh, so Malfoy and Fang, who I, is, is that Hagrid's dog or something yeah he's, he's like a mastiff is. or something who just kind okay. of yeah he, he's there for like security and stuff <laughs> okay so malfoy and fang run uh the figure looks at harry and then his scar hurts like crazy which is like oh clearly voldemort yeah so then a new centaur forenzi forenz forenz uh, i guess Firen- For- forenz he like jumps in and saves harry's life <laughs> uh so apparently the reason that they kept talking about Mars being bright is that centaurs can see the future uh, by looking at the planets. Mm. That's, that's a thing. So Ferenc saying killing unicorns is wrong and the blood keeps you alive even if you were just about to die. But the price you pay is that you live a cursed half-life. Right. Which I don't know what that exactly means, but that's a thing. So he puts like Harry on his back and helps uh, and like rides him back to safety. And he helps Harry realize that it's Voldemort that was doing this, and he's only drinking the blood to live long enough to drink the elixir of life, which means, you know, even if you have a cursed life or whatever, you'll live forever. Yeah. Ferenz leaves and says he hopes the planets are wrong, which I guess means he, if he didn't intervene, Harry was going to die. Yeah. They're, they're like, basically, they're just really into astrology. Yeah, they're <laughs> super into it. So, <laughs> so Harry goes back to talk with Ron, and the cloak turns out to be folded underneath the sheets with another note that says, just in case, with the same handwriting. So someone was a bro and saved the cloak. So then you get to chapter 16, through the trap door. So it's exams. There was a, a, an interesting quote, which is, they had practical exams as well. <laughs> Professor Flitwick called them to make a pineapple tap dance across a desk. So it's basically like having an like oral exam or presentation or something in like a language class. I just thought it was funny that they called it practical. Yeah. Because in what way is making a pineapple tap dance across <laughs> practical? So, Not practical at all. Also, but but fun. Definitely. Uh, but fun. then they get other they get other great finals such as McGonagall making them turn a mouse into a snuff box, <laughs> which I assume is a tissue box. Um, and Snape asking them to make forgetfulness potion, which I think is just a really funny, like, play on words. It's like, ah, oh, I hope you didn't forget how to make forgetfulness <laughs> potion. Ha ha ha. Like, that's the kind of thing I would do if I was a potions teacher. Forgetfulness like, potion, also known as uh, fireball. <laughs> oh, I was going to say alcohol. Or what was giggle it? Giggle juice. What is it? Giggle juice. <laughs> the giggle juice is non-negotiable. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so good. So... Harry's been having more more and worse nightmares since the forest. Further proving that, you know, when he's confronted with things about his parents getting killed, that he just keeps remembering that more intensely. Trauma, um, man. Harry is worried, but the squad is not worried because they're like, ah, oh, Dumbledore and Fluffy will keep everything safe. <laughs> but Harry's like, you don't understand. <laughs> so Harry feels like he forgot to do something. Should have had a remember all. Uh, he realizes he realizes something and then runs to Hagrid with the squad and asks about the egg. This is the thing he apparently forgot to do. So uh, he asks Hagrid to describe again how he got it, and Hagrid says he got it from some creepy dude in a cloak, Voldemort. <laughs> uh, and basically, he says that this guy like got Hagrid really drunk, uh, and he, non knowing any harm of it, revealed that the only way to calm down a big three-headed dog is like to play music and make it fall asleep then the kids are like oh great now voldemort knows how to get through the secret passage yeah so basically lesson of this book is do not go drinking with like a strange cloaked figure yeah or with hagrid because he's the worst drunk clearly or just like don't trust hagrid with your secrets definitely so they try to find dumbledore and they get McGonagall and says that uh, Dumbledore's out of town for, like, this thing in London. And they're like, oh, great. Voldemort also told, found some way to lie and, you know, get Dumbledore to go to London. Very convenient. Um, Harry's like, this is about the Sorcerer's Stone. And she's like, how do you know about the Sorcerer's Stone? <laughs> so she storms off and says that he'll be back tomorrow and we can talk about it then. And they're like, that's not an option. The squad tries to follow Snape and guard the room, but they are thwarted 
And the kids are kind of like, oh, but we're going to lose points. Harry Lake goes on this amazing rant about how this is way bigger than losing some fucking points for a house cup. <laughs> they're like, this is a matter of like life and death. This guy is like the worst person in the world. Yeah. And he's about to become immortal. Like, I don't give a shit if Gryffindor loses a million points. And it's the this guy coolest killed rant. My parents and, I... and also a lot of people. Uh, fuck the house cup. Yeah. <laughs> this guy is the devil. We need to stop him. So uh, the squad's like, fine, we're coming with you. So... Uh, she believes that she's not going to be expelled because she got a 112 on her final exam. How did she? she that's like a the, hell of a curve. Honestly, like everyone awesome. is passing yeah. because of Hermione Granger. Yes. And I think it's fantastic that sh she has this like cocky moment. She's like, they wouldn't expel me. I'm the smartest person ever. It's like, fuck yeah, Hermione. <laughs> like, that's when I started liking it was that sentence. I was like, all right, she's cool now. Yeah. She brings the entire school up. <laughs> yeah. Hermione studies about the stuff that she thinks is going to be the enchantments. Harry grabs a cloak and a flute that he got for Christmas from Hagrid. Convenient. So convenient. Uh, so Neville tries to stop them. Hermione has to use a spell that makes him stiff as a board. She's like, Neville, I'm so sorry. Um, <laughs> so they get past Peeves and they get him to back off by pretending that they are the Baron with the invisibility. And the Baron is the only person that Peeves listens to. And they go through the door play the flute to get past Fluffy. They jump down the trap door and their fall is broken by a plant. And Harry and Ron are like, oh, cool, a plant. Uh, and Hermione's like, no, that's the devil's snare. And they're all like tied up in vines. And they're like, oh, right. She says that they like darkness. So Harry's like, okay, let's light a fire. And then Hermione goes, there's no wood. And then Ron screams, quote, have you gone mad? Are you a witch or not? And then sasses her about it like five more times, which I think is the most appropriate thing in the entire book. Is like, that's so it's like, funny. You're the smartest Easily girl the in part. the school, and yet you cannot, you can't figure out a way to make fire. You didn't put two and two together. <laughs> yeah. They, then they enter a room with birds and a locked door. The birds end up being flying keys, so they, they fly around on brooms and grab them. The next room is giant chess, which is wizard chess, uh, which they've been playing a lot recently. That's wizard's chess. <laughs> they have to take the place of three of the pieces and then get through. Uh, the pieces are legitimately getting killed when they get knocked out. So Ron somehow finds a way that like, if he sacrifices himself, they get checkmate, which I don't think happens in real chess. No. I don't think there's any situation where like the person would be forced to take someone out and then lose, but this is wizard chess. <laughs> so he gets like punched in the face by the queen. I also like don't know any rules of chess, so I'm like, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> yeah, okay, yeah, cool, cool. So then, uh, so they, they, they go through to the next one, and then it's like, it's Snape's thing, which is a logic thing. And there's black and purple fire, and a logic puzzle where they have to like drink particular portions and get through. But this whole time, uh, Voldemort has already gone through the stuff. Like they, there's not enough potion for them to both go through. So basically Harry has to go through and Hermione has to go back. Um, and they get through. Also, one of the doors was like a giant troll and Voldemort just knocked it out. So they literally just got to like walk through and be like, do, do, do casual. Uh, so they get through and then we get to chapter 17, the man with two faces. Uh, and you immediately find out right away that it was Quirrell, like, immediately, because he's, like, chilling there. So Harry's like, what? Snape isn't evil? Huh? Like, I had no idea. It's basically revealed that Snape was actually doing a counter curse at the Quidditch match, and Quirrell was trying to curse Harry's broom, so... Snape was the only one keeping Harry alive, Clearly. which was great. But then the fire distracted Quirrell as well. Um, then the only reason Snape was going to be the ref was to keep Harry safe. Then uh, Quirrell snaps and some rope sees Harry. So he then reveals that he let in the troll and Snape was going to stop Quirrell during the troll attack. Also, the mirror of the Erised is behind Quirrell. Snape had, su had suspected something was up with Quirrell all along, which is why he was with Quirrell so much. Uh, and then... Harry's like, oh, this is what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> like, Snape's actually a good guy. So uh, Harry distracts Quirrell so that he can't focus on the mirror because apparently since the biggest thing that uh, Quirrell slash Voldemort desire is the stone, if they look into the mirror, they should be able to figure out like how to get right. it. So Harry just keeps like trying to bug him so that he doesn't get it. But then the turban is like, bring him here because Voldemort's in the turban. <laughs> so they bring him like towards the mirror. It is then revealed that Snape hated Harry Potter's dad. And then it's also revealed that one time the kids overheard Quirrell like arguing with someone and being really upset. And they thought it was Snape, but it was actually Voldemort. No! So Harry's like, put all two and two things together. So Quirrell says that he met Voldemort while traveling. 
<laughs> and that he was the failed thief at Gringotts. Uh, and that Voldemort punished him by keeping a closer watch, which means living in the back of his head behind this turban. So they they have Harry up at the at the mirror, and they're like, Harry, what do you see? And Harry sees his own reflection take the stone out of his pocket and then wink and then put it back in his pocket. And when he when the f- reflection Harry puts it back in his pocket, it turns out to actually be in his pocket. Right. So I don't know how that worked at Magic. all. Magic. That's how. That's a th- <laughs> so that's a thing. So they're like, what did you see? And he's like, uh, I see me winning the house cup <laughs> and shaking Dumbledore's hand. And Voldemort inside the turban's like, bullshit, no. <laughs> like, easily calls his bluff. I almost killed this kid. <laughs> <laughs> he Quirrell re- dramatically removes the turban and then turns around, and the entire back of his head is just Voldemort's face. Quirrell then grabs Harry, and uh, they both feel pain because, you know, the whole Voldemort touching Harry's skin makes him, I don't know, all sorts of, all sorts of crap. Harry's protected by so, the power of love. Yeah, yeah, that's that, and that is explained later, that the whole thing is the power of love, and it's in Harry's skin. Right. But also, like, the fact that he just keeps touching him and like yeah. basically was like i'm going to burn this person to death basically yeah that's that is that is what happens coral pins him and tries to evade a cadaver him and harry's like oh wait if i just he like grabs his face to push him away and he like freaks out that it burns and harry's like oh if i just touch him he'll die <laughs> so harry harry i assume beats him just by like poking him all over right. <laughs> but, but then he gets like uh he gets like a stress migraine and passes out <laughs> Exactly. He gets like, while he's doing this, he gets like so, such an intense pain in his head that he passes out. And then he wakes up and Dumbledore is there, uh, which I don't know why, but I have, They're I have the this. Wing, by the way. Yeah. I ha- yes. I have this written as Dumbledore is there, LOL. That was the note I put. So <laughs> I think it must've been a very abrupt turn from, I'm fighting someone to like, oh, hey, Dumbledore, yeah. what's up? So he's in the hospital wing, says he's been there for three days. And then Dumbledore basically explains everything that happens and the whole understanding, like, the Snape Harry Potter's dad thing is that James Potter actually saved Snape's life. And that's what made Snape really mad is that they didn't like each other before. And then the ultimate thing was that he saved Snape's life. And he's like, great, this guy I already hate has done, like, the nicest thing to me in the world. So I hate him even right. more. So that's why he was, like, extra harsh on Harry is because he was trying to protect I him. Mean, which is all these I mean, there's other, other reasons, but, like... It's going. Yeah. You're going to find out. <laughs> yeah, it's cuz he it's cuz he likes Harry's yeah. mom. I think that's yeah. That's like the only thing. <laughs> so, and I think and Snape kills Dumbledore, I want to say for the same reason. I don't know, we'll figure yeah, it out. TV. I'll learn. I'll learn. I'll learn. Also, so, I'm not Dumbledore, completely clear like what do they get for winning the house cup like I don't know, just eternal glory. Yeah, eternal glory and like snacks. <laughs> <laughs> I assume. So they're at the feast. Uh, the dining hall is decorated in Slytherin colors to celebrate Slytherin's seventh consecutive win of the Championship House Cup. Dumbledore rises to speak and announces that in light of recent events, more points need to be given out. He awards Ron and Hermione 50 points each and Harry 60 yeah. points. So he only gets 10 more points for beating Evil Incarnate. <laughs> <laughs> um, and oh, and getting the stone. So you would have think Harry would have got like a million and a right. half. Gryffindor thus has a tie with Slytherin. Dumbledore then adds that Neville has been awarded ten points for learning bravery, <laughs> which is complete and utter bullshit. Right. <laughs> the like, most uh, Neville learned how to be a Gryffindor. <laughs> yeah, Neville learned to be in the house that he was assigned right. to. Like that'd be like giving Malfoy ten points for being a douchebag. <laughs> So, so they pull ahead into first place, winning the House Cup by the stupidest decision right. ever. I want to think that the prize for the House Cup is kind of like what we would get at camp for winning Cleanest Cabin, which was like <laughs> a bunch of mozzarella sticks. Yeah, but that's pretty fantastic. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> The, the grades come in. Harry and Ron do well. Hermione's the top of the class. Naturally. And then they all they all pack Ted to the train station to go home. Uh, so Harry, Hermione, and Ron say their goodbyes for the summer. And Harry is home, but he's not, like, super upset about going home because he's excited to try to use his magic on Dudley. And that's <laughs> the end of Harry Potter and the Sorcerer slash Philosopher's Stone. The end. Oh, wow. What what a journey we've gone Seriously. on. Seriously. That's the first book. I will say uh, I liked it a lot. Way better than what I remember from the movies. It's a good story. It's a good yeah. kid's book. Like Yes, totally. That's definitely my thought process is like this is the perfect book for like the age group that it's aimed at. Right. Because it's like 
a little more intense in terms of reading than a children's book, but it's not like super complex or super serious. Exactly. You know, it's like he goes to school, he learns magic, yeah. he plays a sport, he defeats evil incarnate. <laughs> right. It's and it's longer than like a magic treehouse novel. Which were so good though. Well, they were the best. But those were super short. Yeah. Like there's like 50 books in that series and there's seven Harry Potter books. Exactly. So, it, so it's like a little bit more, you know, dense than that, but it's still like yeah. a pretty quick read. Exactly. It's the next step up from Magic Treehouse. Right. It's also like very obviously a first novel because there's just some stuff in there. I'm like, this doesn't even sound like you just like gave up on this paragraph. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There was there was some some things would happen. I would read like an entire page and be like, that page didn't need to happen. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm like, why like, are this you saying paragraph this? was worthless? <laughs> Like, why did we talk about this, JK? Like, what was the point? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm excited to see her her writing get better. Right. It definitely gets better, but there's still, there are still moments like that, especially in, like, Deathly House. Yeah, I've heard, like, the entire fifth book is a moment Ugh. like that. My, what I've known about the future things is that the fifth book is not good, and the seventh one is unnecessarily long. Those are, like, the two things I've heard about the future Yeah, books. there's a lot of camping in the seventh book. Yes, that's um, what I heard. It's like someone, <laughs> someone who described it to me because I was like, don't tell me anything. It's like, it's like, don't worry. They're just going to spend a lot of time in the forest for no reason. And I was like, okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and like the fifth book, the fifth book definitely has its merits. Like it's very much, it, it gets more into like teen relationships Ooh, there. Like cause there's like romance and like gossip and stuff. Oh, yeah, because that's the one where he starts like smanging it with Cho Chang. Yeah, exactly. And then it gets like really intense at the end. The main disappointment for me on that one is the movie. Like, the movie does not live up to. Yeah, so I've seen half of the movie, and by half it's... I saw the beginning, fell asleep during the middle of it, and saw the end. Right. And I I remember not liking it. I've definitely seen the fifth one the most, because it was on HBO, like, all the time when I was in Uh, high school. But you don't like that movie. I don't... I'll watch it. It's not my favorite. Six (laughs) is great. Seven is... Okay, it's more like just emotional for me because I'm like, it's over. No, it's over. But yeah. it's okay. Now J.K. Rowling will make a million spinoffs forever. <sighs> I mean, like, that's a whole nother discussion. <laughs> <laughs> a discussion we'll have later. But yes, thank you so much for joining in on this, Charlotte. Oh, uh, this thank was you for a having super fun me. Time. No problem. This has been magical. And uh, <laughs> and everyone listening, if you want to follow Charlotte along, you can, on Twitter, it's Charlotte8Pi. I don't know if yes. there's any other things you want to plug at this time. Um, I have a YouTube channel. It's youtube.com slash outsider girl because i made it when i was 14 uh, look at you but the, and i also have a blog it's called a suitcase full of pens.com all the links are on my twitter just go to my twitter so yeah so go <laughs> to at charlotte pie and just realize what an amazing human being charlotte is uh, if, as you haven't already learned over this like hour of discussion but thank you so much charlotte for joining and listeners and thanks thank for tuning on shoes. and uh. and until until next time wizard on as they say in hogwarts <laughs> <laughs> is created by Mike Schubert, it is produced by Mike Schubert, it is edited by Mike Schubert, and it is hosted by Mike Schubert, and the music is by Bettina Campomanes. Thanks to everyone who's rated the podcast on iTunes, that really helps. If you want to join these people, you can do so. You can also follow along on SoundCloud and on iTunes, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Pod. But until next time, guys, wizard on!